All right. Hey, everyone. Genome here. I'm here to with my next interview in my ongoing interview series of people who do interesting things. Uh, today's guest uh, is coming to us from way over the other side of the country uh, to talk about her storied career in both film and written uh, industries. So today, we're going to be talking to uh, Deborah Voorhees. She a uh, Friday the 13th Part 5 fame, but uh, there's more to her than the man at the hockey mask. So let's go ahead and have you meet Deborah. Deborah, say a little something to the audience, please. Hey, guys. Um, thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, we're very happy to have you. So it's, uh, it's been a long road coming, but uh, here we are. So we're going to have uh, quite a few questions to get through. We'll just jump in if you're ready. I'm ready. All right. So uh, if you would, Deborah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I guess most everybody in the horror world knows me from Friday the 13th, Part 5. Um, but I am also a director, and I um, am working on a film called 13 Fanboy, which is a horror thriller about a fan who is stalking the women from Friday the 13th. Um, then before that, I was a longtime journalist, and um, of course, I was an actress for a long time before that. And um, I also taught British literature and um, journalism as well. All right, so you've been all over the place as far as uh, career options go, haven't you? I have. Well, I don't like to be bored. Well, yeah, <laughs> I it's like always good to do things. things, you know. That's one of the problems with my channel. Like, I can't seem to focus on one thing at a time. So, um, um, so it looks like, like one of your first occupations was actually teaching. Is that correct? Um, no, first was, um, was actually I worked at the Playboy Club in um, Dallas. And uh, so I was a Playboy bunny there. And I worked, you know, cocktails and that sort of thing in several different clubs. And then um, I went to Los Angeles and worked as an actress and a waitress. <laughs> and then um, uh, then I went to college and then went on to journalism and directing and stuff. That came way after journalism. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, there's a, there's a natural progression there, right? So, but what made you get into the acting game? I'm sorry, say it again. What made you get into the acting game? Hmm, just, you know, it just seemed like something I really wanted to do, a lot of fun. It uh, was intimidating and exciting, and, you know, I thought it was a great idea to pack up my stuff and head out to L.A. I'm glad I did. What was your actual first film role when you got out there? Actually, the first things that I did were here in, um, was in Texas. Um, I started out on the TV show Dallas. I did um, like seven different small speaking parts on there and several um, extra uh, positions. And then I also worked as stand-in, so which meant I was working behind the scenes of the set, which I really loved doing that. Well, that obviously segues pretty well into your later career in, in the movie business, doesn't it? So it's, it's good. Right. I mean, I guess a lot of people probably wouldn't take the advantage of the situation to learn about the behind the scenes. They would just show up, read their lines, and, and go home for the day. But I'm sure it really pays off to learn right. all aspects of the um, trade. I've, I've always made sure that when I on a, was on a film set that I was paying attention and listening. Um, and then when I was working as a stand-in, that meant I was there all day and I would stand in for like Linda Gray and Victoria Principal, basically the dark-headed women. And um, that worked out really nice because uh, one, you become a part of the family, you're um, on the set every day with everyone. And two, it gave me an opportunity to really watch and learn. Um, I stayed pretty, quiet on set because I was very busy um, absorbing and learning um, as opposed to just kind of hanging out and being silly, although that was fun too. Did you uh, audition for a lot of roles that you actually didn't get? Oh, sure. Everybody does. All right. So um, uh, as far as working on Dallas, how many episodes of Dallas did you have doing? Um, well, I did seven small speaking roles on there. And um, then I worked as an extra and then a stand-in, too. Okay. All right. So how did one go from working on TV to being in a movie? Same way you do TV. Same thing. You have an agent, and the agent sends you out on auditions, and you go and audition for stuff. 
Yeah. yeah. I see a lot of stories about like people kind of getting <laughs> pigeonholed into even TV or movies. You know, a lot of times there's not a lot of crossover. So. Right. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, get into some of your film stuff. So uh, everyone, of course, knows you're coming up from Friday 13th, Part 5. Um, right. Did your agent get you uh, uh, in the door in this, or is this something you were actively out campaigning for? No, no, my agent got the interview for me or the audition for me. Yeah, it was a pretty uh, big, basically seemed like very big cattle call. Um, I think I was got there on day three, and um, then I went back another time. But it was even on day three, there were just it was a huge line of people. So I felt very privileged to be chosen and become a part of it. Was that pretty intimidating, showing up and having all those people being there? No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> just just brush it right off. I got this thing right. So. It was, no, it's just you know, it's your job. You know, you're mm -hmm. going there audition you know you get it or you don't you just go in there and audition and that's you know all there is to it gotcha now um uh, i actually reviewed that movie not too long ago on my channel and um i didn't give the movie real high praise but uh mm -hmm. a couple of people i said stood out and you're actually one of them uh because Thank you. well yeah and it's not me just sucking up because you're on the show but um you're one of the few people in that movie that seem to have some life you know you actually had some personality and some zest for life um, Thank you. How close do you think that character was to you personally? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. But um, I do really like. I mean, as far as I mean, there is an aspect of me, particularly when I was younger, just being kind of free and fun-loving uh, kind of a person. And so I guess in that way, but um, yeah, no, we're very different. Um, there is not really much information about why you're at the house, at the facility. So is there any scenes that cut in a movie that kind of go into the backstory of what you or- No, or not at all, <laughs> not at all. I, I came up with my own backstory though. Uh, my backstory is that Tina didn't belong there, that mom and dad were just, um, you know, basically um, religious zealots, prudes, who didn't approve of, you know, Tina's loving attitude. So they sent her away thinking that something was wrong with her and there wasn't anything wrong with her. It was something was wrong with them. All right. Well, um, still, we won't stay on this subject too long, but um, as far as the movie goes, because there's lots of other stuff to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually, let's see, this turns into two parter, but uh, there's actually a pretty extensive nude scene here in this movie. And I imagine it's really uncomfortable, like doing that, you know what I mean? I mean, the audience doesn't see that, but uh, right. when I read, you actually talked with your uh, fellow actor there ahead of time just to get a little more comfortable. Right. So the scene wouldn't be so awkward. Right. Uh, how did that? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a very awkward thing to do. Um, yeah, I did. I met up with um, John Robert Dixon early, so that wouldn't be quite as awkward. Um, and ironically, after all this time, I just directed my uh, first real love scene. Um, I've had some kind of medium little ones that I've directed, but not like a full-blown love scene. And um, it definitely having been in those shoes, um, helped me, I think, um, understand my actors and help, you know, them feel more comfortable. So it's interesting. You know, the voice of experience and people actually tend to listen to someone who's been there in that position before too. Right. And I say, look, I know, I know how you feel. I've been there. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to do, you know. So, so as far as um the end of this we have uh you of course on the bad receiving end of uh, of uh, not jason's uh hedge clippers so you obviously probably wearing a prosthetic right to cover your eyes and blood yes and how long did all that take to apply it well you first you had to make it and uh that's done long before you go on set and then oh my goodness this is hysterical my dogs are out there it's just started raining and they are running and chasing each other through the mud and the rain. 
That's so funny. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, let me go back to your question. Okay. Um, yes, well, the prosthetic was actually made prior to um, the, the film itself. And uh, they basically put this mask on you and um, I was able to breathe, um, but it's ice cold. And so it was kind of like, if you, you know what it feels like to have a brain freeze, only this one you can't get rid of because you can't stop eating the ice cream and get it to stop. It's quite um, uncomfortable, but kind of cool. It was interesting to learn how it was done. Then they take that imprint of your face and they pour in what will eventually be the prosthetic and they pull that out. So then um, applying it on set was about three hours because they have to make real careful that um, there's no lines that gives away that it's, it's not, um, you know, an actual, um, you know, that it's not actually your skin. Yeah, the blending's got to be really important there because otherwise it's really good. Right. Especially such a close-up shot, too. It would just scream at you, you know, phony, phony. Exactly. So, we can have that. exactly. so um, at the very end of that scene, you let out a pretty blood curdle <laughs> scream. Now, <laughs> is this something you can kind of do on command? Or do you have to psych yourself up yeah. to get a scream like that? Yeah, well, then I could. Then I could do it on command. Not anymore. I don't even know if I can scream like that anymore. <laughs> isn't quite as high as it used to be and uh just curious how many takes did it take to get the uh, scream just uh, how the director wanted it i mean i did it right the first time so <laughs> nice <laughs> <laughs> i can think of your vocal cords uh, right oh my goodness so um i won't be hanging on this movie too much longer um and feel free not to answer this there has been a lot of stuff that i've seen and read said that the set was pretty tense um, and it really wasn't a fun set to be on. Is there any truth to this or what was your experience like? Uh, for me, um, I don't know, you know, I can't speak for anybody else, but yeah, no, I definitely didn't find the set to be tense at all. I found it to be quite enjoyable. Some people just enjoy being unhappy. What can I say? But it was a lot of fun actually. Good. See, it's, it's refreshing to get a different take on things because, you know, some people have been irritated over the years. It's, it's hard to tell. You, right. know, you only hear one side of the story, you know. Right. But, um, all right, so appearing in this movie and some other films, it appears you might have been, like, marked with a scarlet letter afterwards because didn't it affect your career afterwards, at least in teaching? Uh, well, yeah, not for acting, of course not. Um, that doesn't hurt you. But, yeah. I definitely um, had some issues with um, school boards and stuff who had a problem, you know, with um, me being in Friday the 13th, but, you know, hey, it's okay. Um, you know, everybody, it is what it is. You know, some people are um, a bit more prudish. I don't really understand it. Um, it wasn't, I didn't do anything illegal. It's Paramount film. Um, so, yeah, no, I don't get it, but hey, that's all right. I left teaching and went back to um, what I love, which is creative, being creative and making movies. So, I just noticed that my vacuum cleaner is in the background. I couldn't see that. <laughs> what? Oh, wow. What do you know? Well, I didn't want to say anything after we started, but uh, <laughs> there we go. How's that? <laughs> See, Deborah is a real person, folks. If in case you didn't believe, so um, yeah, she has all the implements and structure in her house, like I do. So. That's right. There you go. Here, we'll try this again. Let's see. <laughs> if that. That. See, that's how you uh, you uh, fix your the and apply too. I like that. That's all those years as a director, right? <laughs> um, so from there, you kind of you had some more film roles after that movie, but it seemed like it kind of started slowing down. <laughs> after a couple of years after that and then you kind of started going didn't really slow down, no i just left mm -hmm. um Los Angeles, and i went to go to college and um graduated on top of my class and became a journalist i worked at the fort Worth star telegram the dallas morning news front desk magazine modern luxury magazine um the shakespeare standard um so yeah no just switched gears is all gotcha so 
you, you really seem to have, you, you're doing it for a long time. You really must have enjoyed the journalism game quite a bit, eh? Oh, very much so. Um, it was well over a decade and um, yeah, no, I loved it. I, I loved, I, it was wonderful that people would sit down and share their life and their story with you. Gee, I wouldn't know what that's like. Um, <laughs> um, so, okay. So after, you know, you're, you're enjoying yourself in the journalism gig, um, what prompted you to kind of steer back into the movie gig? Well, after um, realizing that I wasn't going to be teaching, <laughs> you know, because I was thrown out of two high schools, um, I taught British literature and journalism. I just and uh, I taught for a little while in college. Um, taught acting in college, and that was enjoyable. And, and that was nice. But um, I just I realized it was time to get back into a profession a little less judgmental. <laughs> well, yeah, everyone has an opinion, and unfortunately, it's easier on op-eds or whatever they can share it with you. Much easier than they can in film, right? Right. Um, so when you started back in the film, it seems like uh, you were definitely not focused on being in front of the camera anymore. You were focused to be more behind the camera and doing everything else. Uh, Absolutely. Is that just something that naturally progressed, or is that something you were just aiming for all along? Um, well, I think probably more of a progression. I started writing, once I left Hollywood, I started writing screenplays. You know, the first couple were pretty bad. And then they started getting better and better until I was like, hey, I'm starting to get pretty good at this and pretty happy with what I'm doing. So, um, you know, um, yeah, so that's, I wrote uh, 13 Fanboy with my producing partner, Jill Paul Isaac, and uh, yeah, we got a pretty scary script for you guys. And we're all looking forward to seeing it too, let me tell you. I noticed Thanks. on your um, your list of accolades there, you have basically everything you can do in the movie business you've done, you director, producer, writer, uh, editor, mm -hmm. which of these roles is your favorite to do and which one do you think best suits your skill set? Um, my, my favorite is directing and editing and, um, well, and writing. Okay, so I didn't pick one, but, um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I do enjoy, in to some extent, the producing side of it, but I would much rather just stick to the creative side, but hey, you want to get your movie done, you better produce your damn movie, you know, so you just have to, you have to do it and make it work. Yeah, sometimes you have to go out of the rain by that horse yourself, don't you, if you want to get something pushed through. I saw that when you oh, yeah. that earlier. <laughs> oh, yeah, and don't whine. Stop whining. That happens when you're supposed to. <laughs> yeah. I can't stand whining. It just, it drives me crazy. I don't like whining. I hate whining. <laughs> Then just deal with it because we need you and I'm sick of your bullshit. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Interview. Somebody's like, oh my goodness, I have a, a screenplay and oh my goodness, I can't. Um, oh, I haven't been able to raise $5 million. And I'm like, darling, you've never even done a film. Damn right you're scared. I can see that in your eyes. And you think somebody's going to give you $5 million? <laughs> Chances are very slim. <laughs> I mean, Write something that you could do for a whole lot less and start, show yourself, show what you can do, show your ability, you know, don't just, um, yeah, oh, well, so-and-so was so lucky. No, look at their career. Look what they did. I'll bet you you'll find that they made their own road, you know? Yeah, I can't imagine it's a game for the uh, the tumbleweed just letting you, you know, letting the winds of change blow you whichever way, you know, you need to go up and actually no, no, direct no. yourself to. There are a thousand things that will come up during the course of making a movie that will tell you, you cannot do it. It can't be done. You might as well throw in the towel and give up. And the only difference between those who make their movies and don't is the ones that do don't give up and they keep moving forward no matter what. So, all right, let's talk about 13 fanboy a little bit here. Um, you're basically uh, doing everything, once again, directing, producing, or at least co-producing, everything. So tell us a little bit about the film, if you would, and, uh, you know, anything else you want to put out there about it. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Well, 13 Fanboy is really, it's blending three different genres. It's a, a horror, it's thriller, and a mystery. You're not going to know really who the killer is until the very end. And... Um, the it's think of like a the thriller like Cape Fear, 
and then add in the horror kills and that's what you have it's um very intense it's very realistic whereas friday the 13th is more of a saturday afternoon matinee uh, film that everybody wants to go to and have some fun and kind of laugh and you know have a good time it's not like you leave the theater and that you're afraid that jason's in the parking lot because you know he's been resurrected from the dead many times i mean it's not a realistic film and it's fun scary it's scary like jump out of your seat kind of thing but it's not the kind of thing that's going to make you look over your shoulder this will make you look over your shoulder because it's more realistic it's um or it is realistic um in when i once after it was written and i started talking to several of the women in with friday the 13th several of them have been um, victims of stalking so there's a lot of truth and such in this film yeah as if memory serves adrian king had a really bad stalker and it got her out of the business completely yeah. for like two decades yep. Yeah, right. Great. Adrian, um, Laura Park Lincoln, same thing. Yeah, a lot, quite a few of them did. Judy Aronson was also had a stalker. So, yeah, it's pretty intense. And as we all know from past experience, it's it's no joke. I mean, you got to take all that serious. So, yeah, it's just. It's, oh, yeah. So, yeah, there could be some grounding in reality of the movie here, unfortunately. Right. But, um, right. Laura Park Lincoln was stalked for six and a half years. And um, the guy even shot at her, just barely missed her. And she was married and everything, so it wasn't like she was alone. So that shows you just <laughs> how warped some minds can be, you know. Um, so what got you wanting to do another Friday film? Um, is it? Well, it's not a Friday the 13th film. This is a very different spin -off, film. maybe? Um, you know, I, I suppose somebody might consider it that I don't. Um, it really is um, really going out and looking to create another um, like genre within the horror genre in the same way that like say paranormal um, found footage kind of films um, found another niche within this I think will be another niche within the horror market because basically we have actors who are playing themselves, fictional versions, yes, but themselves. But I've also chosen parts of the script that fit some of who they are. So you actually direct, produce, write, and act in this film, is that correct? Correct. So mm -hmm. that must take an enormous amount of your time. How do you, how do you juggle so many yeah. roles simultaneously? Yes, and those are not even, you know, I mean, promoting the film, you know, um, raising money, the producing side of it is huge. So, yeah, there's there's a lot to it. I'm very grateful to have Joel Paul Reisick, um working with me. He's um, a longtime experienced um, producer. He has about 25 films under his belt. And, um, yeah. So I'm very thrilled to have him on board. That makes it a lot easier. Yeah, I've read um, quite a few testimonials of actual people involved in the production from actors and mm -hmm. from everybody. And they almost universally say that uh, you kind of create a really warm, friendly environment there. Is this, uh, is this just par for the course or is it just easier because they've all been there before and know the source material? That's a good question. No, I try to make sure that's the case on any of the sets I have. Now, of course, it doesn't always work out. There, you know, it, typically there's always a little bit of friction on a set because you put a lot of different personalities into a room. Somebody's going to, you know, not get along. Uh, but one of the things I stress before bringing anybody on board is that I'm looking for people who. Um, can be polite and kind and um, such. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's gotta be so difficult to do with so many disparate personalities all in one space, you know, and you're crunched for time and the lights are everywhere and you're working long hours. So yeah, it's like herding cats, as we used to say in the army, I bet it's really not fun at all sometimes. Right, but, it, it can be quite, quite intense, but I have to say, you know, we have a terrific um, professional crew and, um, you know, everybody works super hard. I'm very grateful 
for everybody who came. All right. Um, I had a one of my viewers wanted to ask a question. Um, sure. And his name is Metalog, and he said, uh, "Where did it go?" And of course, he can't see it when you're looking for it. But basically, the gist of his question was, "Did you have any uh, reservations about being in a slasher film?" And you think, did you think it maybe it would uh, make it difficult for you to get more serious actress roles? Nope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, when you are an actor, you take what acting gigs come your way. Um, you know, you don't necessarily dictate exactly the role that you want. Uh, to pass up on being in Friday the 13th would have been silly. So, yeah, no, of course not. You know, now, look at Jim Curtis, look at um, Kevin Bacon, you know, come they on. All, they all say pretty well afterwards, didn't they? Yeah, they, they did <laughs> fine. I'm not too worried about it. Yeah, especially early on I, in, in this one's career, I bet I'd be like, just take it, take it, take it, you know. Exactly. <laughs> you start exactly. saying no enough, the word gets around, I'm sure, that the dog, oh, yeah. you know. But, exactly. So do you have a, a filmmaker or another movie maker, writer, whatever, who inspires you, like, not so much as a role model, but kind of maybe inspires your work a little bit? The, well, I, I would, it would be hard for me to pick one. Um, I have several that um, I really admire, and um, I try to look at everybody's work and try and understand what they're doing what tools are using to tell the story and incorporate what I think works for me, you know? So, um, I couldn't pick one, but there are a bunch. Well, that's, it's always good because there's so many people out there. Yeah. I mean, it, it is hard to pick one. One someone asked you to pick your favorite album of all time, you know I mean? There's, right. I put you on a spot like that, like I just did. But, um, <laughs> actually speaking of favorites, we'll ask you this one though. Do you have a favorite film of all time? Yes. Okay. And it's not a horror film. Oh, I, I have a favorite horror film too, and I'll name that one. But my first all-time favorite film is, um, some of you know I'm a Shakespeare geek, but I absolutely adore um, the film with Kenneth Brennan and um, Emma Thompson. Hang on just a second. I have a bad dog. Hold on. Got a bad feeling about this. My favorite film um, of all times is Kenneth Brannan's um, Much Ado About Nothing with Emma Thomas. I, Thomas, I absolutely love that film. It is hysterical. Um, everything about it is just a perfect little gem. And then, sorry. <laughs> they, they seem to be <laughs> At five dogs. <laughs> Usually if my husband's here, he tries to keep them under control, but he's not here. So everybody's having their talk right now. So, but for a horror film, it's a 1950s film and it's called A Bad Seed because I don't think there's anything scarier than a little blonde girl with pigtails who's also a serial killer. <laughs> yeah, I remember liking, uh, what was it, A Midsummer's Night's Dream that uh, had, what, Kevin Klein in it. I remember oh. it was a pretty good Shakespeare film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we used to see right. in the park all the time back in Orlando, but uh, we don't get that much here in West Virginia. So <laughs> here it's like right. Putin and Putin in the <laughs> in the park. But, right. uh, <laughs> so hey, I know you got to, you got a family to look after right there, and you got some uh, dogs just craving your attention right now. So we'll go ahead and start wrapping up. Um, is there anything else out there you'd like to, to tell everybody or get out there? Well, um, we still because we went over on our Indiegogo campaign, we still have that out there. Um, you can go to 13 Fanboy at Indiegogo, and we're in demand, basically, um, until we're finished editing the film. So join us, um, and uh, get your name in the credits. So thank you. All right. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And uh, most of us can't wait. Do we have a scheduled release date of when this movie is going to be ready for prime time, as we say? Well, we don't have, no, we don't have a scheduled release date, but um, the goal is 2020. 2020. All right, people. So make sure to keep an eye out for that. Uh, plenty of stuff out there to see, especially over on the 13 Fanboy uh, Facebook page. There's a lot of uh, updates there. Is there any place else they can find information about it that's official? Um, well, 13 Fanboy page on uh, Facebook. Come over to my horror group in uh, on Facebook called um, Deborah Voorhees Share Horror. And um, let's see. 
Um, those are the best places. You can also check out voorheesfilms.com, either any of those places. All right, great information out there. Well, Deborah, I'll let you get back to your day. I know uh, you've had to listen to my jabber for long enough, so I really appreciate you being on the show, and um, hopefully maybe we can have you on in the future after the movie hits or whatever. And it, it's, a, it's a huge hit, and everyone's loving it. So uh, once again, I just want to thank you, and all my viewers want to thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. All right. So this has been another uh, Genome production. So stay tuned for the next interview, which will be with Mr. John Beatty. Should be sometime next week. And I uh, hope you all enjoy. So until next time, this is Genome with Deborah Voorhees. Out.